chewing on your pencil in class, fidgeting with jewelry when you're anxious, bouncing your foot on the floor, turning down the car radio in busy traffic so you can see better. I'm sure that many of you can relate to these examples or something similar to them, but what do they all have in common? The answer is they all show the average ability to manage your senses. However, there's a slightly different picture when someone can't manage their senses as well as the average person. It might look like someone rocking back and forth on the floor, covering their ears in loud rooms, hitting someone that tried to hug them, or a meltdown in a crowded place. Despite the contrast between those actions and the ones I described earlier, they have the exact same cause, sensory processing. Hi, my name is Courtney Sindelar, and today I'm going to be talking about how self-regulation of sensory processing causes the difference between turning down loud music and running out of a noisy room. To start, everyone has a different threshold for each of the eight senses in order to reach the calm alert state. As defined by Atkinson and Boyd, the calm alert state is the window in which the body's ability to function is maximized. This basically just means that calm alert is when a person's senses align so they can focus and work the best. The eight senses are sight, smell, hearing, touch, taste, deep pressure, which is called proprioception, motion, which is called vestibular, and interoception which is the sense about the body's internal state. The thresholds for each of these senses show the amount of input you need in order to reach calm alert. Let's say that in the average day, everyone receives four blocks of sensory input. The daily noise you hear, things you see, movement you get, all fill up four blocks. So if someone has a four block auditory threshold, great. They can focus with the average amount of noise in their environment. But what happens if someone needs more input in order to focus? This person would have a high auditory threshold, maybe seven blocks instead of four. So to fill up those other three blocks and reach calm alert, this person might need to listen to music while doing homework in order to focus best. Some other examples of high thresholds could include fidgeting with jewelry for a high tactile or touch threshold, bouncing your foot on the floor for a high motion or vestibular threshold, or chewing on your pencil for a high deep pressure or proprioception threshold. On the other hand, what happens if someone only has a two block auditory threshold? This person would need to reduce the amount of noise in their environment so they can focus. This is called a low threshold. Other examples of low thresholds include avoiding rooms with strong smells for a low olfactory threshold, not being able to focus while eating for a low taste threshold, and turning down the car radio to see better for a low auditory threshold. However, all of those actions seem like pretty normal responses. The average person can make their own choices and manage their own thresholds. This is called self-regulation. Occupational therapist Abigail McKenzie defines self-regulation as the ability to maintain, attain, and change attention levels in an environment. Most people have a moderate ability to self-regulate meaning they're at a good balance of responding enough to change their level of senses, but not overreacting. But what about some of the not-so-normal responses I listed earlier, like rocking back and forth or covering their ears in loud rooms? These actions were identified by Fraser, Ballas, and Turley as common actions of people with disabilities. However, the extreme actions and the normal actions actually have the same cause, sensory thresholds. Rocking back and forth fulfills a high vestibular threshold, and covering their ears reduces noise for a low auditory threshold. The only difference in these actions lies in the person's ability to self-regulate, which is often harder for people with disabilities. Winnie Dunn's study showed that about 2 to 4% of the population have more extreme responses to sensory stimuli. And while it's not reserved for people with disabilities, it is more common for them to fall into this category. Goodman and Conway found that 40% of children with sensory processing issues also have ADHD, and that 90% of children with autism have sensory processing issues. However, people with disabilities get judged so often, even though they have the exact same causes. 
An average person with a low touch threshold might just tell someone, oh sorry, I'm not a hugger. A person with disabilities might not have the self-regulation level to have the same response, and their action could turn into yelling at or hitting somebody that tried to hug them. Society tends to quickly blame a person's character for their responses, and they don't take into account the environment that caused them to act that way. The director of the Sensory Therapies and Research Center in Colorado, Lucy J. Miller, summed up this dilemma by saying, everybody thinks they're a bad kid, but they're not a bad kid. They're just misunderstood. Not a bad kid, just misunderstood. If you don't walk away from my TED Talk with anything else, remember that. People with disabilities are so quickly judged and presumed to have strange behaviors when in reality they are just misunderstood. From getting kicked out of schools for bad behavior to silent judgments from strangers in public, the lives of people with disabilities are riddled with misunderstanding if they can't regulate their senses. But what is the answer to all this? The best solution so far is what Dr. Jean Eyre has called a sensory diet. The Maddie's experiments defined a sensory diet as a planned program of specific sensory activities designed to promote someone's ability to focus at the calm alert state. It's basically just finding sensory adaptations to a person's normal routine. For the average person that can easily self-regulate, a sensory diet is a natural part of life. For people with disabilities that can't easily self-regulate, Occupational therapists have to plan a sensory diet for them to address their more severe sensory processing needs. Christina and Michael gave some common examples of sensory diets designed for children with disabilities. They could include yoga balls to sit on while working, which addresses the high vestibular threshold often paired with autism, or a pair of noise-canceling headphones that reduces noise and meets the low auditory threshold that children with ADHD often experience. The proprioception sense and the vestibular sense were called the powerhouse senses. Atkinson and Boyd discussed how the proprioception sense is like the override sense. No matter what issues someone is having with their sensory thresholds, whether it's a high visual threshold or a low tactile threshold, giving input to the proprioception sense neutralizes all of the thresholds. So if you can get a child with autism that's having a meltdown in a crowded place to jump up and down or do some other form of heavy work, the response that was a result of this overwhelmed threshold is gone. Abigail McKenzie found that input to the proprioceptive sense can regulate the processing system for up to two hours, and that input to the vestibular sense, which can include spinning or swinging, can regulate for up to eight hours. Sensory diets take away the extreme responses, which proves that the cause of the actions of people with disabilities isn't their behavior. It's just their inability to regulate their sensory thresholds. There's always been a group of people that believe in curing disabilities. They believe that people shouldn't have to live with their disability and that a cure might help to normalize their life. However, the people that believe in this lack a certain acceptance of those with disabilities. And as Vanderbilt professor Kyle Banks said, we don't want to go to changing people to fit into our world. Understanding sensory processing helps to prove to people that there doesn't need to be a cure for disabilities. There just needs to be more understanding and more acceptance of those with disabilities to help them fit into the world that has been structured for the typical person. To conclude, understanding sensory processing can only lead to a healthier and a more supportive community for not only everybody, but specifically for people with disabilities. Society as a whole lacks knowledge about sensory processing issues, and this just builds on the assumption that the cause of the actions of people with disabilities are behavior issues instead of unfulfilled sensory thresholds. It's quick human nature to think that someone's personality caused them to act a certain way, when in reality, the strength of sensory stimuli in an environment affects our actions way more than most people realize. Understanding sensory processing will help to prove that just through more understanding and more acceptance, we can reduce the divide between the average person and people with disabilities. Everybody should learn and understand the underlying forces for not only their actions, but for the actions of people different from them. Because as Maya Angelou once said, we are more alike than we are unalike. 
Knowledge of how self-regulation of sensory processing impacts a person's behavior will only serve to eliminate misunderstandings and prove the similarities between everyone. 